it's time for another episode of the Josh Cast. And I'm realizing as I'm looking at this digital recorder that the very first sound that was recorded for this podcast was me smacking my lips. So that's sexy. Do we do a theme today? Well, now that I brought it up, we have to do a theme. I can't just bring it up and not do a theme. Josh Cast. It's been a month since I've eaten processed sugar. No, wait, it's been two months by now. Or maybe it's been a month and a half. I don't really remember. But I tell you something. I actually feel better eating salads. That is not a brag. That should only tell you that my life is sad. Ooh, kind of a Sondheim-esque sound with that. Yeah, I've talked about this before. I've seen other comedians talk about this. I know this is a well-worn topic. Musical theater. uh, Which I used to do a lot of. And, And my parents would always take me to see the musical theater shows at the Temple Buell Theater in Denver, Colorado. Yeah, come to think of it, I don't know why it was called the Temple Buell Theater. Is it a temple or is it... Is it a temple or is it a theater? What is it? You gotta pick one. I think the very first musical I ever saw live was The Unsinkable Molly Brown with Debbie Reynolds. And... Okay, this is crazy. So there's a, there was a... In the show, the guy tries to lift Debbie Reynolds, and the, uh, and he struggles to do it, and they make a joke about it. And I remember my parents thinking, oh, that was, my mom especially, oh, that was so funny. What a great ad lib. And then, years later, I can't, re- I can't remember who it was. I think it was a director or an actor or something in a play I was in was talking about that moment and how it was actually not ad-libbed, it was scripted. But they were so good at making it seem like it was ad-libbed. It, it, it impressed my mother. That's the point I'm trying to make. Actually, what is the point I'm trying to make with this? There's no point that I'm trying to make at this point. I'm just reporting on what happened. And that was, uh, that one was not in the Buell Theater. That one was in the, I think it's called the, is it the, which, what, what was it called? I can't remember, but there was a smaller theater. Then they built the Buell Theater, which, and that's what I, where we saw all the other musicals. And it was, it was too big. It was hard to hear them sometimes. Phantom of the Opera. I think that, I think we saw that one in Temple Buell. This is... Another episode of Old Person Trying to Remember Things podcast. But anyway, the show's in the big Buell Theater. It was too big. The big auditorium. Ah. Too big. Couldn't hear. Fan of the opera. Couldn't understand a word that they were singing. When I can't understand what they are singing in Fan of the Opera, I'm no longer watching a musical or a, an operetta. I'm watching two hours of depressed people standing and humming. That's what it becomes. Because there's not a lot, I mean, there wasn't a lot of, uh, you know, in all those scenes with the Phantom and Christine, 
you know, there's not much physically they can do. It's a lot of, you know, singing at each other. Yeah, nothing. Ah, that was a miserable. So when the movie came out, I was excited because I could finally sit down and watch it and he- and hear what they were singing. I'm in my mid 20s, sitting in an apartment in in Torrance, California, going, "Finally, I get this." And I'm just I'm waiting for them to make everything into a movie. That's, you know, they haven't made Wicked into a movie yet. That's what I'm waiting for. Because it was such a process to, you know, drive, got to dress up, you got to, all these big crowds. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. For someone who, I, 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 uh, I I came to realize, as someone who's done theater for years, I hate theater. (laughs) I don't hate it. I hate watching it. I'd rather, I'd rather do it. I'm a doer. For some things, I would rather watch. I mean, I wouldn't want to do MMA. I'd rather, you know, watch MMA. Although I'm not, you know, I wouldn't even watch MMA. Never got into it. I'm not trying to make any judgments against it. Not saying it's good or bad. I think if MMA, if MMA took place on a spaceship, I'd be there. Kind of a big sci-fi person, as I'm sure you've noticed. But not a, uh, yeah, not not so much a fan of of seeing plays in big spaces. I like it when it's a more intimate space, so I can see and hear what's going on. I saw a college production of Equus at the school I was going to attend. When I was going there to visit. A necklace, of course, involves nudity. And I remember that the, the woman who got naked in the show, her brother was there seeing it, her older brother, and he had to look away, couldn't even look when she got naked. And I'm back and forth on the on the idea of nudity in plays, because I feel that there are some who say it's it's necessary, it, it or it can be necessary, and it makes a point. And I think there are others that say it's gratuitous. I mean, I don't. I, I think you can you can make the point without it. But by the same token, I mean, I can see both sides. It is pretty powerful when someone is standing in front of you naked and uh, sex is not involved. In fact, usually, if somebody is standing in front of you naked and sex is not involved, and it's not a theatrical production, it usually something terrible <laughs> is, is happening. Not a lot of positive situations. You're at the office, your boss comes in totally naked. Jenkins, I need you to file these. Sure thing, Mr. Stevens, sure thing. But that's how much of that, though, in my own head, is social programming and remnants of a sexually dysfunctional culture that created America. There's nothing wrong with nudity, and yet I'm, you know, not saying anything you don't know. The R, you know, the R-rated movies have nudity. The PG-rated movies have people decapitating each other. Sex is not handled well in this country. It seems like it's handled so much better in Europe. And it doesn't seem like there's... And I could be just projecting this. I don't know. But it, does, it just doesn't seem like there's the same level of neuroses associated with sex in Europe that there is here. You know, it's just you have sex or you have tea or you do both. And that's it. 
versus in America, there's I don't know. It's or I'm or I'm just projecting, and I'm the one with the sexual hangups. I, you know, I don't know. I keep saying I want to have more. Maybe I don't. I know that I don't want to be the one who approaches. I just don't want to be, I don't want to be that guy. In other words, a guy. I'm a reluctant guy. I'm not a fan of guys. And that's the other thing, too. You know, I... I, I've discussed I've I've discussed my sexuality. I'm, you know, mostly straight. Sometimes I find I'm attracted to guys, not much though. I'm more attracted to women. And the older I get and the more I know this to be true about myself, frankly, the more disappointed I am in this reality. And I don't And I I have to be careful because I, you know, I I also don't think, for instance, I'm a woman trapped in a guy's body when I say this. Because I want to be very sensitive because that's, you know, there are people who are that way. And I don't want to come off like I am insulting them when I say what I'm about to say. But I really feel that I'd be so much better as a woman. (laughs) I'd kill it as a woman. I would be phenomenal as a woman. My God. Ah, oh, I'd be knocking it out of the park. But that's just, I'm, you know, this cisgendered piece of crap. Is cisgender the right word? I'm still learning the verbiage. Well, now this podcast is getting depressing. But I'm telling myself, listen. Give yourself permission to try not to be funny in this situation. Just try to talk about what's true. And let the humor come. Let the humor just wash over you. Let the inspiration just just sink into you. And the jokes will come. Let it happen, man. Let it happen. So that's, yeah, me being lonely, I guess. And, you know, I say, I always, you know, I say, oh, I'm lonely, I'm lonely, I'm lonely. And I am. But living alone, is all, there's a lot of advantages to it. You know, I have this problem where no matter who I'm dealing with, sooner or later, they annoy me. And this is always, I know I'm the one with the problem here, but the, if, I, if I was with somebody, at some point in the process, I would need to take a break. And it's nothing that they are doing. Sometimes people annoy me just by sitting there. There's something about them that's like, ah, oh, you're, you're getting on my nerves. Like complete strangers will sit next to me at a coffee bean and there's nothing that they're doing. They're just drinking their coffee but there's something about their essence. It's like, ah, I can feel you being annoying right now. Stop it. They're, they're not even doing anything audible. It's just there, there's something... It's just like I'm sitting there thinking, oh, you're trouble. I can tell. You're a troublemaker. Yeah, you're one of those people who stabs other people in the back. And I create this whole backstory for this person. You're cheating on your spouse. I can feel it. Home wrecker. Don't even know the person. Craziness. But I, must persevere. I must persever. What am I even saying right now? 
starting to feel the diet catch up with me. I was eating a lot of sandwiches, a lot of Chris sandwiches from Costco. I think I ate all of them over the course of two days. So now I'm starting to feel it. But I've been, I, did, I had a salad for dinner and some spring rolls. It's odd, the more I quit sugar, the more salad is, I'm able to deal with salad. And you know, that sounds like it's a positive, but it's not. I much prefer cookies. But that's the point. That's why I got to stop the cookies. Because I'm trying to not be addicted to things. And that way, the energy that was going into addiction can go into things that I love to do. Like worrying about death. Or worrying about the environment. There's a truck driving by. Arctic Glacier. Premium ice. Premium ice. Not the kind of crap you find on the ground. No. Premium ice. Top-notch ice. We travel to a secluded mountain spring deep in the Himalayas and collect water that we believe touched the Buddha. And then we make it into ice so that you can put it into your Shirley Temple as you attempt to blend in in a social situation where you don't really want to drink and you wish you could drink. But due to a family history of alcoholism, you're simply drinking a Shirley Temple. And the entire conversation you are having with the person next to you is insipid and rather dull. But you don't quite know how to excuse yourself from that situation. And while the awkwardness of the situation is reminding you that even though that you are surrounded by people, you are in fact alone, that you have always been alone, and that you ever shall be alone, and you are sipping on your drink, know that the ice in your drink is premium ice. Arctic premium ice. That went deep. That totally went deep. I hate exiting out of a conversation. I hate it. At a party, something like that, I hate How do you get out of this? Because there's a point at which, there's a point at which it's, there's a point at which in every conversation, it's over for one of the two people. I've been on both ends of this, where either I can see that it's over, or they can kind of see that it's over. I can fake it, I can fake a conversation, But deep down, I'm not really feeling it. And then they realize it and they'll say, I'll let you go. Which, of course, you know what? Which which is true. Thank you for letting me go. I can't stand talking to you. Thank you for showing compassion. I'm trying to think of the last genuine conversation I had that I really felt like this was enjoyable. I think it was, ironically, with my dad, the last time I visited. That was a fun day. We were making fun of this giant hotel. It's ridiculous. This ridiculous hotel that they built next to the airport that has a waterfall inside of it. Because that's America. In fact, if you scroll down 9,000 podcasts, you'll probably find me talking about it. Oh, 
got to deal with this person walking. That's the problem. I know I shouldn't be this way about pedestrians as a motorist. But they get in the way. Move. I'm trying to get to Starbucks so I can get my fruit plate. So I can go and write 20 more jokes about how I'm inadequate. You can never have too many of those jokes. <laughs>